Hey Fish Tube, how's it going? So today we're gonna to talk about the discus water, how I keep it, how I've kept it for years. All right, let's talk about the filters. So it's a three-part system. It's a sediment filter, which is five microns. And then there is a granule carbon filter, which is one micron. And then it goes down to a block carbon filter, which is a half a micron. So this is good enough to get the chlorines out. Now, the problem with my system here is half the year we are on well water and the other half is city water. So when the city water comes in, I'm pretty confident there's chloramines in it. So it could be okay. I'd probably be okay with the filters, but I just don't take a risk. I've had chloramines knock out a few tanks in my past. Usually when the seasons change, they flush out their systems and they use heavy, heavy chlorine, uh, more than usual to really uh, clean out those systems and make sure there's no bacteria in the water. So I use the Prime. Now, do I recommend that for everybody? That's up to you. You know, that's something you're gonna have to check. Now, the water companies aren't required to tell you when they're gonna do this. So it could just happen one day. So now I wanna talk about the RO system. So it runs through the first system I just talked about with the tap, and then it splits off from the main line into the RO system. And then it runs through the same filters again. So kind of an overkill, but I believe in redundancy. I believe in just taking precautions. Um, if you ever had discus go down because of water, it's, it's pretty rough. So this is just something I've done because for me, it just makes me feel a little more confident about changing water at heavy, at heavy ratios, you know, 50%, 60%, 70%. Uh, most of my tanks get 20% unless they're small fry. But then they run through the RO system and then they go through, a final step is a 10 micron um, granule, carbon. So the reason I do that is because I've noticed that at about three, four, well, about four or five months, six months, uh, there's a little bit of bacteria in the water. So this just helps clean that out. Is it a perfect system? No, there's still, bacteria in the water a little bit at, towards the end of the uh, cycle of the filters. So that's why I put peat in. Now a lot of people put peat in to lower the pH and I'm sure it does that a little bit, but I use it more for the antibacterial and the antifungal properties. Um, I just find that uh, it just tends to, I have better hatch rates with a little bit of peat in the water. It's not a ton of peat, it's these bags, they've been in there a year. So it's not the actual peat that's uh, causing it, it's the decaying of the peat. So you have to understand that you don't want to keep changing the peat out. So basically I let the peat go until it just disintegrates to nothing. So there's three bags in there. One bag has an air stone. So yes, I do pump air into my soft water. A lot of people leave it stagnant. I don't. Um, I just like that, that airflow. So what I do then is I put um, the trace elements in. Not a lot because it's a 40 gallon barrel. So I put a cap full are 10 milliliters of the trace. But then I supplement it with a, I think it's a half a tablespoon. I'll have to check on that. I believe it's a half a tablespoon of calcium magnesium. Now I mix my own calcium magnesium. I buy food grade. So I use um, a four to one ratio, four parts calcium to one part magnesium. And that's worked real well for me. Um, so between those things, that's how I, substitute the water to make sure it's got enough minerals. This usually gets me about to 100 to 160 parts per million. It's really tough with the PPM because the peat's adding, you know, particulates in there. So it just tends to work for me at that that ratio to to breed the discus. Okay, so the next part is going to be a little controversial for some people. I it works for me. So I put actually a buffer in there and it's a buffer from Seachem. I don't put a lot, I put about a half a teaspoon, yeah, half a teaspoon of the buffer. Um, it's the 6.8. And what I find is my water is about 8.5 coming out of the tap at, at the peak at well water. It goes down to 8.2. Now it fluctuates because I've gotten 7.8 readings, I've got 8, I've got 8.2, I've got 8.5. So it's kind of all over with the pH, but I really don't worry about the pH anymore. So what happens is as it runs through the system, it gets to the RO, into the barrel, it's about a 7.2. To me, that's not low enough. I like it on the acidic side. 
So I like that 6.8 because then all kinds of issues aren't happening as far as bacteria is and stuff, but the peat really kicks that in. But I use that peat for a little bit of dropping the pH and it's supposed to soften the water too. Now the water's soft already, so I'm not really going after that, but it works. So it's personal. That's what I wanna say. If it works for you, do it. If it doesn't, then don't, okay? Just figure it out. But I just find that the disc is pretty good at that 6668. Um, 120 to 160. Now, if I'm not getting a good spawn at 160, then I will drop that water and do a little bit more pure RO in there and get that down to that 120. And it's like it's like magic every time. So I just want to explain that this is how I do it. Again, do it your way. This is just another option. All I have to say is on the internet, you're going to get a ton of varying uh, opinions. And that's what a lot of them are, their opinions. So go with what works for you, okay? All right, so you notice that I have these barrels. This is something I learned a long time ago for me personally was aging water. I just find I get way better results when I age the water. And what's nice is I can put ice cold water in there from the winter time. And within a day or two, it gets up to that 70. I want to say 75 to 78 in my room. Um, I like that because I got a heavy air stone going in there, so I'm not worried about pH rising or anything like that. I just, for me, it's about the, the circulation and keeping the water flowing in those. So that's the thing, you know, I use, I am overkilling. I want to explain that, but I've had issues and I just don't want issues anymore. So with the water coming in, it's heavily filtered, it's heavily aerated it's aged and it's treated, okay? That's, that's, yes, overkill. But I've lost fish and I will not lose fish again. So I'm gonna do everything I can to be safe, okay? So redundancy for me is huge in this, uh, just because I've been doing it a long time and I've seen the worst of the worst. You'll notice my water change system here. I don't use auto water changes for those few reasons. I like to aerate, I like to age. Um, I just feel more comfortable. And here's the thing, I used to have 60 big tanks with discus and it was all done on auto water changes and I had auto feeders and I thought I was living the life because I could just let things go. That's the problem, is I got lazy and I let things go. And wouldn't you know, I went two or three days without going in my fish room because I'm thinking, oh, you know, it's handled. I'll go in there in a couple days. Well, an auto feeder stuck on and an auto water changer got clogged with calcium. In California, it's heavy, heavy calcium. So it just gummed it up. So those two things killed about $3,000 worth of fish. So what I, I came to the conclusion that if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna touch those tanks daily. That's just something personal. That doesn't mean the, the auto water change isn't good. So my system is, I consider it a manual water change. So I'm kind of, I am the mechanical filtration. I am taking the debris out because I want to look at those tanks. I want to see what's going on. And yes, I inspect the poop. I do all that because I'm just insane like that. But I just want to make sure everything's healthy. And then you'll notice the, uh, auto, so it's a semi-auto. I have a remote control where I can press the water on and off because what I found was, uh, tanks were overflowing because I'd start a tank and then I'd kind of go do something else. But so by having this uh, um, the remote control on me, I can shut that water. Even if it overflows, it's okay. Uh, all the flooring is waterproof outdoor carpet in here. So that's another thing that I like is this outdoor carpet because it just helps hold the heat and it doesn't it resists mold and mildew. So for me, it's a no-brainer. So I want to talk a little bit about biosecurity. Um, now it would be in the perfect world, you would change out a hose every time, you would do you know all this stuff, you would have a separate room for your fish that you quarantine, you're bringing in, but that's just not the real world. So I try to quarantine my fish the best I can, I watch them, I do not put them with other fish for about 30 days, but up to 90 days. But one thing I'll do is after I do a water change on a tank, and this is not necessary because these hoses don't go in the tank, but just something from me touching them, and I just take them to the sink, and I have a sink, I fill it with hot water when I'm doing water changes, and I'll drop the, those hoses in between uh, tanks. I'll, I'll rinse my hands with water, 
and also I'll drop my nets or any equipment that's touched water in there. Now is that a little bit of an overkill? Yes, but I don't have much disease anymore except for what I bring in. As far as when I get a fish healthy, it's pretty much healthy for the rest of its life because once I get a pair together, there's no reason to add any other fish to that. Uh, so I'm real careful about what I put into the tanks, also what goes out of the tanks. I'm kind of aware of what's going in, what's coming out because that, so that visual part for me is why I feel like I'm pretty successful at this. Because if you're gonna do one or the other, I would do the auto water changes before the auto feeders. Just personally, that's something that I've found uh, would work better for me personally. But uh, that's my motto. And I just tell myself this all the time, don't be lazy. Get down there and touch that, those tanks every single day. Uh, I try to get in my room at least an hour in the morning and then an hour at night. Now that doesn't always happen because I got five kids, I got two businesses, I'm trying to do this YouTube thing which is just insane, but it's been amazing for me. You guys, I am just shocked at the amount of people that are watching my channel. I'm shocked at how many different countries watch my channel. Um, it, it just it may, it humbles me. So the reason I got into YouTube was one day I got like seven or eight texts from people I know that were having problems or questions. And I looked over to my wife and I said, hey, I should start a YouTube channel. And we both just laughed and said, yeah, that'll happen. So that was a Wednesday. By Friday, I'd gotten all the equipment I had around the house laying around. I, I researched everything. By Saturday, I shot my first video. By Sunday, I released it. And it just kind of snowballed since then. But what I found is my phone has kind of stopped ringing or my texts have stopped coming because I can just get maybe a text from somebody and then it, it's an idea for a video. So I really appreciate all you guys. If, you've, if you're hanging out this long, maybe think about subscribing if you haven't. If not, please like or comment if you have any questions. I try to get to all my comments, okay? I try to get the same day if I can, but sometimes it's not possible. So always within 24 hours, I, I try to respond. But I just wanna thank everyone. I am just blown away again by the response I'm getting and um, just the coolest people I'm meeting in this, you know, this hobby. So thank you, have a great day, and be safe, bye.